Um, I'm Elizabeth Foster Nolan. I am the president of the League of Women Voters of Massachusetts. I have been here many times before. Um, I want to thank the Hingham League of Women Voters for inviting me once again to moderate this candidates forum. I do not live in Hingham. I live over in Weymouth, um, although I was born and raised here. So I just like to make, make sure that um, people know that I do not live here at this point. Um, the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization for women and men, which encourages informed and active participation in our government. This forum is part of our ongoing voter education efforts to help voters make informed decisions at the upcoming elections. We hope that over the course of this evening, you will learn more about the candidates and what they hope to do for Hingham. I will start by explaining the procedures for this evening's forum, which each candidate received ahead of time. We have two groups of candidates this evening, those who are in contested races and those who are in uncontested races. For each candidate who is in an uncontested race, uh, they will be given two minutes to give a statement. For the, um, for the candidates in, um, who could not join us this evening who are in uncontested races, they did send in statements, which I will read, so you will have to hear me several times um, at the beginning of this. Um, there will be no questions for those who are in uncontested races. For those candidates who are in contested races, each of you will have two minutes for an opening statement, one minute for a closing statement, and one minute to answer each question. There will be no rebuttal, as this is an informational forum and not a debate. Opening statements will be done uh, based on where the person appears in the ballot, and then for closing statements, we will reverse that order. And for questions and who will go first, that was determined by a lottery held earlier this afternoon by the Hingham Candidate Forum Committee. Um, after the first question, we will rotate the order of who answers first. Uh, the timekeepers are sitting in the first row for the candidates. Um, they will prompt you when you are close to the end of your allotted, allotted time. You will see a yellow 30-second card. Um, so you know you're almost at the end. When you see the red stop, please finish your thought and wrap it up. Um, I will ask you to, <laughs> <laughs> if you continue speaking after the stop sign, um, I will say thank you and move on to the next speaker, but I will let you, con you know, finish your thought. Um, personal references about candidates are out of order. Um, there is a camera in the back of the room. Um, a link to tonight's forum will be posted on the League of Women Voters uh, Hingham website and on their Facebook page. The forum will also be rebroadcast on Harbor Media, uh, on the local Hingham cable channels, and on their YouTube channel uh, until the May 14th election. Uh, we ask that there not be any audio or videotaping of the forum as we have um, excellent video and audio already taking place and the video is um, the property of the League. So those here in the audience, I know it's a little strange, we haven't been here for a while. Um, so we do ask that cell phones be turned off, iPhones, anything that might make us a sound or be distracting. Um, and we ask that you all treat candidates uh, fairly. Please remain quiet during the forum, no clapping, cheering, calling out, uh, with the exception that after the end of each piece, um, of the forum, you may clap for all the candidates if you wish. Um, I don't see a problem here. There's no, can there's no candidate uh, paraphernalia, stickers, or anything that can be allowed in the room, but I don't see any, so we don't have to worry about that. And then questions were prepared by the League of Women Voters um, of Hingham with input from community members who submitted questions. We will not be taking questions from the floor this evening, and no candidate was provided copies of questions uh, prior to this evening, and we'll be hearing the questions for the first time uh, this evening. So with that, I would ask those uncontested uh, candidates who are here to come to the front so we can start with their statements. That would be Mr. Puzo, Mr. Fisher, and Mr. Carr. And we will start with you, Mr. Puzo, for two minutes. Thank you. Uh, 
Michael Puzo, currently serving as Hingham Town moderator and a candidate for re-election. I'd like to make three essential points. Uh, one, I'd like to note Hingham's continuing commitment to open town meeting, where each uh, voter has the opportunity to participate with voice and vote. I would submit that open town meeting is a core value of the town of Hingham and really helps define us as a community. The role of the moderator, of course, is to participate in that meeting and to oversee its conduct with a goal of having it run fairly, efficiently, and build confidence in the voter that the procedure is a fair and open one and that the outcomes that are reached uh, are reached fairly and understood to be so. The other responsibility that the moderator has that is somewhat less visible is along with the members of the select board to appoint citizens to various boards and committees. It's an essential obligation and responsibility of the moderator and one that I take extremely seriously. The moderator has the responsibility of appointing all 15 members of the advisory committee along with the five members of the personnel board, other members of committees including Cleaner Greener Hingham, CPC, the Audit Committee, and then task committees such as the Foster School Building Committee and the Public Safety Building Committee. If you have not yet had an opportunity to do so, I encourage you, ex exhort you, urge you to uh, complete a talent bank form. Uh, it's readily found on the town's website. It'll take you five minutes to fill it out, but to offer service to the town as many are doing who are here tonight. Uh, last, I'd just like to observe that the fact that we are here tonight is just another example of Hingham's commitment to participating in open uh, government. The League, of course, says uh, consistently that democracy is not a spectator sport. You have to get into the game, and I encourage you to do so. We'll be interviewing the Select Board and I candidates for open positions in the next several weeks with a goal of filling those positions by June 30th, so we start the year July 1 off and running. We have a big year ahead of us and it's going to take the entire community to participate to get the town's work done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Puzo. Mr. Fisher. Yes, my name is Joe Fisher. I am currently the chair of the select board. I have a list here because there are 12 priorities that I see for the town that I intend to devote my attention and time to over the next three years. First, the budget. We need to reconcile town expenditures with ongoing revenue. Second, we need to bring to completion two major capital projects, the new school building to replace Foster Elementary School that first opened 71 years ago and a public safety facility to serve as new police headquarters and to house our firefighters who are currently based at the North Fire Station, which was built 81 years ago. Third, move forward with our plans for an expanded senior center. Fourth, continue to focus on environmental concerns with a goal of achieving a zero sum of carbon emissions produced and taken out of the atmosphere. Fifth, move forward with the Inner Harbor Coastal Resiliency Improvement Project to fortify our harbor against the increasing effects of climate change. Six, assure that town services and businesses are accessible to persons with disabilities. Seven, maintain and grow our stock of affordable housing. Eight, reestablish a public swimming pool at South Shore Country Club. Nine, preserve the historic features of our town. Number 10, support our public library. 11, promote diversity, equity, and inclusion within the town of Hingham. And number 12, build better bike paths, which I think is very important for the town. I ask for your vote on May 14th. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Um, I will now um, read a statement from Chrissy Roberts, um, who is running for the bo uh, Board of Assessors. Um, she is not able to be with us this evening. Um, I am so sorry I can, can't be with you this evening. I'm excited to be running for re-election to another three-year term on the Board of Assessors. As chair with four years of experience on the board, I'm in a great position to continue serving the town with my acquired knowledge while still learning new areas and adding value in fresh ways. I am proud to continue to serve the town of Hingham alongside the incredibly dedicated and knowledgeable employees that work in the assessor's office. Thank you very much. And um, the next person who is running uncontested is Michelle, excuse me, is Michael Reeve. 
who was running for the Municipal Light Board, um, and there was an error on the order of events. He is not a candidate for re-election, um, but I will be reading his statement next. Um, my name is Michael Reeve, candidate for the Hingham Municipal Light Board. With my wife and two children, I have lived in Hingham for seven years and am well qualified to serve on the board. I have many years of professional experience in all phases of energy management, degrees in chemistry and environmental science, and supplemental training in electrical engineering. I have been privileged to serve on the town's Energy Action Committee and am a member of Hingham Net Zero, our town's grassroots climate action group. Three fundamental principles guide my candidacy. Reliability, continuing the practices that enable us to keep lights on no matter the weather, like proactively replacing worn transformers and wiring and trimming tree limbs. Two, affordability, continually searching for long-term contracts and other mechanisms to lock in power at the most favorable rates, keeping overhead expenses low, and managing peak demand. Three, sustainability, managing all of the above within the bounds of our resources while steadily increasing the share of our supply portfolio coming from renewable sources. I'd like to see the light plant intensify its efforts to foster solar installations in Hingham so that we may grow, grow sources of renewable energy right here in town. To these principles, I add a fourth, resiliency. If one component of our grid is knocked out of commission, we need the ability to instantly shift to other resources to maintain or quickly restore power. I urge all of us to do whatever we can to help Hingham attain its goal of net zero carbon emissions by 2040. Support the comprehensive climate action plan currently being developed for the town in alignment with the Commonwealth's roadmap. Make a carbon reduction energy efficiency plan for your household. Our town owned electric utility is a precious resource as we navigate our increasingly complex energy future. I can help. Board members Jack Ryan and Laura Burns chart a steady course, extending the light plant's excellent record of delivering high value for ratepayers while prudently leveraging its resources to support the town's net zero go. I am ready for this challenge and will do my best to serve you well. Thank you. Mr. Carr. Thank you. Uh, I'm Gordon Carr. I'm a candidate for re-election for another five-year term on the Hingham Planning Board. Uh, the five years uh, flew by despite the last two. Um, and I've said before, it's a steep learning curve on the planning board. Um, I benefited from very fantastic and patient current and former colleagues uh, on that uh, to learn and understand the project review and approval processes that we, um, that we undertake in the administration of the zoning bylaw. Um, but we were also able to actually do some, uh, some planning um, uh, during the first term, and there's a lot more to be done. I know many people in this room participated in the master plan uh, development. A couple of my fellow committee members are, are here as well. It's nice to see them in person again. Um, and it was a fabulous process, the visioning process that started it, um, which had probably a dozen large-scale uh, community visioning processes and a, uh, a public survey of over 1,000 or almost 1,000 responses. So we had a pretty good baseline about what the priorities were uh, for the town of Hingham and the residents um, here looking forward for the next 10 to 15 years. Um, while COVID kind of threw a curve on our, uh, on our process, we didn't miss a beat. Uh, the committee worked tirelessly and collaboratively, um, finished up a plan with, I think I have it right, 146 recommendations uh, on, on a variety of different goals. Um, so one of the reasons that uh, I'm interested in re-upping for another uh, term is to see that implemented. Uh, and to see that, uh, that we're tracking those, um, uh, those recommendations. And there's a lot of other uh, work to be done. The development patterns are not slowing down, so the projects are gonna still keep coming. We have the housing choice and MBTA communities uh, that we will need to address. We may have an ADU um, uh, bylaw coming up. We have the Climate Action Plan Committee. Uh, this is a busy place and a busy town with a lot of volunteers that are doing a lot of great work. Much of it's going to come through the planning board from uh, both the planning and administrative process. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carr. Um, Michelle um, Larned, who is running for Housing Authority, um, was unable to join us tonight but did not send us a statement. Um, so the last um, person for the uncontested offices um, is Stephen Buckley, who is running for Recreation Committee. And he did send in a statement. Um, my name is Steve Buckley, and I'm running for the Hingham Recreation Commission. My wife Nancy and I have been residents of Hingham for the past 34 years. 
We raised our two children, Kristen and Stephen Jr., here and now have five grandchildren, three of whom also live in Hingham. Growing up, my children and now my grandchildren have taken full advantage of many of the terrific programs offered by the Recreation Department, first as campers and then as counselors. My daughter Kristen also served one year as director of the summer drama program and then served as assistant director of the summer camp for two more years. I am running for Recreation Commission because I have a lifetime of interest and experience in sports and recreation of all kinds. And I would love the opportunity to share that experience with a group as energetic and committed to the Hingham Rec Department as the current commission members are. My degree in physical education and my experience as an athlete and coach at many levels, along with my love of the town of Hingham and the desire to give back, makes me an ideal candidate for this position. I am running unopposed, and I would appreciate your vote as a sign of support. Thank you. So thank you, gentlemen. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, we will now um, move on to the Board of Assessors. Um, however, we do not have two candidates here this evening. Mr. Chambers um, has, is not here. We are not sure um, why, but we have reached out to him and he's not here. So we're going to ask Mr. Randall, excuse me, Mr. Winters, um, to join us for a two-minute statement. Um, and we cannot have um, questions at this time because the policy of the League of Women Voters is that we cannot have a one-chair debate. Um, but we want to give uh, Mr. Winters the opportunity to, to um, speak to you this evening, and he will have two minutes for a statement. Thank you. Thank you to the League, and uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so I'm running for the Board of Assessors. Uh, my name is Randy Winters. Um, I've lived in Hingham for nine years, and um, I'm, my wife, Laura, is the owner of the Hingham Anchor in town here. I have three young daughters, uh, 11, 9, 4 years old, um, all in the public schools. Um, I've been a member of the Hort Affordable Housing Trust for the past year. Um, sort of a perpetual youth sports coach for my daughters. Um, I stay involved as much as I can in, in all of their activities. Um, I didn't grow up in Hingham, but uh, my parents live in Hingham and my sister and her family live in Hingham. Um, so we've grown a little bit of a, a branch of our family tree here. Um, we've you know, built some strong roots here. Um, I graduated from Boston College, uh, both MBA and undergraduate in finance. Um, I've worked in real estate valuation and analysis for the past 15 years. Um, I worked for a real estate law firm handling property tax appeals for commercial properties in Washington, D.C. Um, I've worked uh, at a startup handling um, real estate private lending uh, valuations uh, for a national portfolio of residential properties. Uh, in the past three years, I've been running my own business, uh, a real estate private lending business focusing on valuation uh, and analysis of residential properties in Massachusetts. So I've experienced on both sides of the equation in terms of the property types that we're dealing with uh, in, in our town here for assessment purposes. Um, finally, uh, to speak to the moderator's point earlier, um, I have, uh, I've been involved, involved in youth athletics, nonprofit organizations in town for many years, uh, but I was drawn to larger civic civic roles, uh, civic roles um, about a year ago. As I went through the talent bank interview process and found a home on the Affordable Housing Trust, there's been some great work being done there. I'm, I'm actually really, really excited about some of the things that, we're, that, uh, that we have um, uh, in the future for us there, and I'll, I'll continue working with that board through the remainder of my term there and, and hopefully even further. Um, but this role specifically really kind of hits home more so. Um, you know, this is more specifically tied to, to my background um, and, and was a stronger draw. Um, you know, when this opportunity came, came around, um, you know, I just felt like given the experience that I've had with the Affordable Housing Trust and, and just other activities and, and involvement that I've had in town, I felt like this was really, you know, a, a great fit for me given my background. Um, oh, two minutes is up. Got it. Quick. Sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, all set anyways. Thank you so much, um, and we appreciate you joining us this evening. All right, thank you. <laughs> We will now move on to the Board of Health. And I'm going to ask before I begin, burn? Yes. Okay. Just like to make sure <laughs> before we begin. Um, so we will uh, start with your opening statements. Dr. Schultz, you are first. Um, you have two minutes. 
Um, so I will let you begin. I'll do my best for two minutes. Uh, my name is Kirk Schultz. I'm running for re-election to the Board of Health. This is the uh, sixth term I'm in. Um, you know, I was born in Otis Hill. I lived my entire life in the South Shore. I now live in uh, South uh, Hingham, right around the corner from Gordon. And uh, I, my first experience with uh, Hingham Town government was back in the early 2000s, where um, the issue was our water supply. And I was put on this public uh, task force to report to the Board of Health about, uh, a, well, at the time, it was Mass American Water Company not acquiring. And that led to my being interested in attending board meetings and eventually getting on to the Board of Health. The Board of Health does two essential things, right? We uh, protect the public health generally, but we manage communicable diseases, right? The polios, the uh, TB, COVID. You know, many of you had COVID this past year. You probably get a call from one of our employees uh, regarding uh, con contract tracing, regarding uh, uh, your, your quarantining. And then uh, second, the most important thing, is protecting our public water supply. And that's where Title V fits into it because septic systems, you know, the more houses we have in Hingham, they sit above our aquifer. And that, uh, the pollution from the septic systems, we have more and more, and that's getting down into the groundwater. And so, um, you know, I know septic, uh, Title V very well. Uh, I can talk about that a little bit later in the, uh, the closing. But uh, I look forward to uh, continuing my time on the uh, Board of Health and ask for your uh, vote in the upcoming election and look forward to the questions that we have here today. Thank you very much. Ms. Byrne, you have two minutes. Okay. Thank you to the League and thank you to Elizabeth for this evening. I'm Rosemary Byrne. I am a nurse practitioner. I'm a Hingham native and I'm running for a seat on the Board of Health. I've worked in the medical field for 20 years at the bedside at Mass General Hospital and for the last 14 as an owner and clinical director of an um, outpatient practice. So I've, I understand the balance involved with balancing health needs in, within the structure of an organization. Um, I'm not a septic expert, however I do know how crucially important it is to protect our groundwater and keep our public health safe at a very basic level. Um, another aspect of the Board of Health that I'm very passionate about is the more health promotion aspect. And in early 2020, the board put out a plan for a healthy 2020 with some, the goal was to increase public health campaigns. However, we know what happened in early 2020, so a lot of that had to go by the wayside, which probably should have then. And now I think it's time to reignite some of that public health um, uh, aspects. There will be a shared epidemiologist that we will have with Cohasset and Hull, so we'll have some real data tailored to aspects of public health that are impacting our residents specifically, and we can then use social media, harbor media, traditional media to help address some of that. Um, I have two daughters at uh, Hingham Middle School and South Elementary. I have been involved in the PTOs in various charities, Hingham Youth Field Hockey, and I would feel very honored to serve a town that I love very much. So I humbly ask for your support in the election on May 14th. Thank you. We'll now move on to the question portion. And we have a new feature this year. Questions will be up there. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I will still read them, but just for reference, they will, still, they will be up there both for the audience to look at um, as well as if you want to refresh. But I'm happy to repeat a question if you do need it. Um, so Dr. Schultz, we'll begin with you. The Board of Health establishes policies involving domestic abuse, food inspections, tobacco, alcohol and other drugs, water quality, well applications and sanitation, emergency preparedness responses, residential development applications, and control of infectious diseases, among other concerns. What unique skill set do you have that qualifies you to hold a position on the Board of Health? I think it's obvious that I've done all those things for close to uh, 18 years. Um, as far as the well applications, you know, the current thing that we're working on the Board of Health is developing brand new regulations for geothermal wells, you know, for our net zero in town. Uh, as far as emergency preparedness, I participated in those um, events right in this very room. Um, you know, residential development, housing is the most important thing we, we really oversee in Hingham. And so uh, the fact that we're fortunately away from the 40B, that the jamming these things down our throat into the 
FRDs, the, the flexible residential developments, is essential because we're developing a new model uh, policy on how to promote those and have those as a standard because there just aren't house lots left as many in Hingham. So we're going to see more cluster development. We need to do it efficiently and safely. Um, and so FRD is that's really the future and we're working on those right now. Again, I, I've done all those things. I, 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 there's Thank nothing you. up there I'm unfamiliar with. Thank you. Ms. Burns. Um, so in the field of medicine, we're never done learning. I'm constantly having to research and adapt to new treatment protocols, new diagnoses. Um, in my current role, I helped draft the policy and procedure manual for a six-site um, national company that um, treats critically ill patients. So I'm used to being able to analyze the data, learn up on, on treatments or aspects that I might not necessarily be familiar with, but, and then be able to put them into practical applications. Um, I've been an educator as well. I taught nurses that were training at Mass General, um, and so I'm able to analyze and pull the data and then put it in a format that's um, palatable or um, understandable for others. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Burns, COVID spotlighted significant strain placed on local public health departments across the nation. What lessons can we take from the past two years to aid the town in meeting future threats to public health? So I think it would be really easy to sit here and look back and judge what was done because it was such an you know unprecedented time like everyone likes to say but it really was and things were changing so fast i was impressed with the town's response in developing a command staff that was meeting you know at sue sarney and um the town administrator and the police chief were meeting daily and analyze you know looking at the numbers and figuring out what decisions needed to be made i think Hopefully, we would never need to do this again, but if something were to happen in the future, I think it would be really important to pull the Board of Health in earlier um, and have an increased communication to the residents of the town of what really specifically is happening in terms of case numbers and the rationale behind um, different policies that were put into place. Yeah, that's right. We did pull together a group uh, in which the Board of Health, we oversaw uh, Ms. Sarney, and, and we tried to keep an even keel on what we did. We didn't want to be extremists, and so we did exceed the state guidelines twice relative to face coverings. Um, you know, I, I, a couple things that we did right and a couple things we did wrong. Um, as far as um, in the beginning, you, you heard, you know, restaurant inspections. Uh, I thought that was essential. And, you know, we had no employees. Everyone was home. And so I did those myself. And so going to each of the various, not restaurants, uh, um, grocery store inspections, uh, going to each of the grocery stores and, and talking about the best practices that we're learning from COVID and what it was, because most people are frightened from this. As far as getting people in and, and looking at the employees that are working in the, uh, uh, the nursing homes and the uh, uh, um, elderly care facilities, I lost that one. I thought we should have been there in a broader way. I thought that our fire department, we, that we should have done those inspections, but you know, uh, but people didn't agree that that was something that they wanted to do at that time. They thought it was uh, uh, a little bit too much. And, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Dr. Schultz. Yeah. The health department staff includes the executive health officer, health agent, and board consultant engineer. How do you believe the board of health members should interact with the staff? And they should interact with a, uh, a very light touch. You know, one of the things I'm known for is I like to stay in my lane. You know, I'll talk about my issues, but I don't like to tell you what your jobs are as far as uh, the other town officers and, and, and boards that we have. Same thing with employees. They work for Ms. Sarney, and she is in charge of those employees, and we assess how these employees do their job through her. And so when you have a lot of cooks on the... Uh, on the range, um, things uh, don't come out that well. They don't taste very good. And so we're responsible for overseeing her management, her running of the health department. And I know this from my own office. Uh, you need to have someone, a compliance officer and a compliance expert that's in charge of that uh, office and you expect the employees to uh, respond and do what their job is. And so too many people trying to jump in there and say, do this, do that, that doesn't work. Doesn't work in town government, doesn't work in the Board of Health. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Burns. Um, I agree with 
Dr. Schultz on this one that um, the staff of the health department are really the experts when it comes to the public health in Hingham in this town. And so the board is there to weigh in when there are decisions that need to be made that um, may not be as straightforward or that require a little bit of debate or um, further research. And um, the other staff member that I would add to that list is the social worker that I think we're really lucky to have a social worker working for our town. And so um, figuring out how to make that more of an awareness throughout town um, and how residents can access the services of the social worker, whether it's regarding food access, um, housing, legal assistance, um, accessing mental health supports. So um, I agree with what you're saying in terms of relying on them for their expertise and helping to navigate when, when needed. Thank you. Ms. Byrne, looking at all the policies that you'll be involved with, from wastewater to control of infectious disease, please explain how you would work with other departments and committees that you interface with in Hingham. Um, I will play nicely. <laughs> um, no, I, um, in many of my roles, have had to work with various departments, whether I'm working with a physician, with um, a, a more hands-on administrative role in the clinic, and so, um, I work collaboratively very well with people. I'm willing to listen. I know, um, I'm not afraid to say when I don't know something and when I need to rely on someone for an answer or when I need to do my own research. Um, and like I said before, the, the people working in these departments really are the experts. And so I plan to rely on them to help teach me and to offer my service when help is needed. Thank you. Uh, great question. Um, one of the reasons that I actually stepped up to help out with the sewer commission was because of my expertise on the Board of Health and being the chair of the Hingham Master Wastewater uh, Planning Committee. But I'll tell you what I do. You know, before COVID, every Thursday, that's my day off, the unofficial day off of ourselves, that I come to Town Hall. I walk around here and I go to the different departments and just, just chat, just to get to know the people who actually run the departments. You know, we boards, we give direction as far as policy, but they run the place. And so to come in, to hear things early, to kind of give a suggestion here about what their suggestions is. I remember Mary Savage, oh, she was always on my case about uh, she had a specific opinion and, and uh, you know, I need to keep in my lane. Well, absolutely, Mary. But uh, that's what I learned. You need to come here, you need to come here a lot. And Joe does the same thing. I see him here a lot. So that's the secret of working with the various departments, is being here, walking around, talking to the executive directors for all these different agencies and entities. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move on to your closing statements, and they are in reverse order of your opening statements. So Ms. Byrne, you have one minute for your closing. Great, thank you. Um, as I said before, I was born and raised in Hingham. I returned 15 years ago to start my family. Um, I care deeply for this town. I um, attended Boston College and then earned my master's in nursing from Mass General Hospital. Um, I have over 20 years of experience in the medical field. My family has been committed to serving the public. So my mother and her parents were both physicians. My grandmother was the first woman appointed to the Wisconsin State Board of Health in 1957. My father was the community center president for many years. My husband works in law enforcement and is a uh, high school football coach. So. Um, I'm trying to compete with him and, and say that I can serve um, the community as well. But um, it's really important to us that we show that to our daughters, um, that it's important to step up and volunteer when it's time to help take care of your community. So I'd be so excited to step into this role, and I would be so thankful for your support on the 14th. Thank you. That was fabulous. Um, Stepping up is the, 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 really the term that I caught from there. You know, since I've been here in Hingham, uh, since the early 2000s I got involved, you know, I've been to every town meeting. I was there this past Saturday. Um, of the 200 board meetings, that Board of Health meetings, I missed one. I was in the hospital for a number of days. I was on the uh, Water Supply Committee, never missed a one of those. Go look at the minutes. Um, as far as the 40B applications, uh, the shipyard application, uh, Linden Ponds, 901 Main Street, um, um, Riverstone, I went to every one of those. 
you know, to provide the comment from the boards of health, from my perspective and the board of health. So, you know, I, I've given back. I, I'm here. Uh, I, I participate. I'll be there. Uh, I'll continue to do that if I'm blessed enough to be uh, reelected to the position. But, you know, this is really so enjoyable. I've done other state boards for 20 years. This is the, the cream of the crop, Hingham, and what I do here. So I really appreciate your vote, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you both for joining us this evening. We appreciate your being here. Um, we would now ask those uh, candidates for school committee to join us. Our largest group this evening, welcome. Um, we will start with your opening statements, and each of you have two minutes for your opening statements. And we will start with Ms. Carenti. I want to thank the League of Women Voters for having this event and the moderator. I'm Ness Carenti. I'm running for re-election to the school committee. Um, with it being Teacher Appreciation Week, I want to say a heartfelt thank you to our teachers. They have been through a lot these past couple years. Um, I think they are on the front lines. and. Um, you know, I, I worry where we are headed as a nation. Um, I think we're headed for a public education crisis. We've certainly seen teachers who are retiring early and leaving education to go to other jobs, um, and Hingham is not Im immune to that. So um, I think we need to extend grace to our teachers um, even after this appreciation week. So uh, the other struggle that we're, we're dealing with is the um, high rates of anxiety and stress and depression coming out of the pandemic for our students. Um, they need our support and guidance. We must continue to address post-pandemic learning loss. Um, as a result of the budget increase last year, we were able to add more teaching staff and adjustment counselors. Um, and the data shows that we're actually benefiting from that. Um, we can also support our students' social emotional well-being with um, more 21st century holistic learning. Um, program, programs like the box program that I do before school, um, it, it helps the kids just get energized and get their, um, run, out their, run out their energy so that they are ready to learn once the classroom starts. Um, so I was really pleased that I was able, I was able to start that program. Um, we must support our special education students and families with more and stronger in-district services. And we need to normalize special education among, among our children's peer groups, as well as vocational education. Uh, not all children are college bound, and they need programs to help them thrive. Um, the next few years are going to be critical and exciting for our district as we welcome our new superintendent, director of business and support services, principals, and vice principals. Um, my experience on the district's um, finance and capital subcommittee, as well as the townwide sustainable budget task force, my years as a CPA and a CFO, um, allowed me to advocate for the students and taxpayers of our town. So I welcome your vote on the 14th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's so nice to be here with you today, see everyone in person. Thank you for joining, and thank you to the league for hosting. As some of you know, my family's lived on the South Shore for decades, and I grew up in Hingham. Um, we have a strong legacy of public service in my family, and I hope to continue that. I'm running for a school committee because I strongly believe in the value of a quality public education. It's imperative for both our schools and our town that the right people are selected to help us heal from the last few years and help our schools set a powerful course to move ahead. To move ahead, I believe our schools need three things. We need improved communications, we need a stronger sense of community, and we need a really clear course of action. So first, communications. We need better communications with our family that's transparent, timely, and effective. Let's learn from the past few years where we found opportunities to increase engagement with parents, but also where the lost opportunities were. 
Second, community. We've heard repeatedly in the news and in our homes that both learning and mental health have taken a blow the last few years. It will take time to remedy, but I'm committed to putting our students first. In speaking with student leaders recently, this is not how they feel, and the focus must go back to them. And then finally, a clear course of action. I'll work to build in metrics that hold us accountable to the high standards that we expect in Hingham. We need tangible goals that are shared with the community and reported back on consistently so that parents and administrators can assess the progress as we move forward. Hingham schools are at a crossroads. We're onboarding a new superintendent, a new business director, and multiple principals, and we're crafting a strategic plan to take the district forward. We need to see and feel positive progress. As a community, our students and teachers need to feel they're supported, welcomed, and celebrated. From the beginning of this campaign, I've aimed to provide tangible and actionable ideas about where we can improve our schools. I understand where the real opportunities are because I've been highly committed and engaged for over a decade. So I look forward to be able to seeing some of these ideas take shape as we move ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cosman. Thank you. Thanks to the League of Women's Voters and to everyone for being here. Uh, so my name is Matt Cosman. I grew up in Hingham. Uh, graduated from Hingham High School, uh, as did my wife, Emily. Uh, we moved back to town in 2007, and we have three children in the Hingham Public Schools now. Our son is in sixth grade at the middle school, and we have two daughters at foster school in fifth and second grade. Uh, after Hingham High, I went to Colgate University, then worked for PwC for four years, got my MBA at Northwestern's Business School, Kellogg, and then worked at Fidelity Investments for the last 15 years. Uh, the first 14 years of that, I did. Uh, worked in internal strategy consulting. In the last seven years uh, within there, I was a part of our senior leadership team. In the last year, I transitioned into a managing director role where I'm helping to lead uh, some of uh, relationships with some of our largest institutional clients. All of my work experience has been looking at data, dealing with ambiguous situations, making strategic recommendations, and working with stakeholders on coming up with the right approach, whether we agree or disagree. So why am I running for school committee? I care deeply about this town. I care deeply about the schools. I uh, sincerely appreciate what the school committee has gone through over the last two years. They've worked tire tirelessly on behalf of the town and the students. But I do think there's things we can do better. There's three areas of the school committee that I think we can work uh, better in terms of the how. The first is I think we need to have more open and robust debate on the most important issues. The second is I think we need to hold our district leaders to a higher level of accountability. And the third is, I think we need to work even more collaboratively with other boards, like the Select Board and the AgCom Board, as we prepare for a potential override. I have four key priorities that I would focus on. The first is communication. I think we need to have more effective and consistent communication by both the school committee and the district. The second is the budget. We definitely have gaps, um, but we also have the context of uh, a, a town budget that we need to manage, and we need to make sure how we can uh, work within the budget that we have more efficiently and to reallocate towards those gaps. The third is a focus on learning loss and social and emotional well-being. We need to create specific actionable plans. And finally, special education is important to me. I look forward to talking about that in my closing statement. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I've done this like 15 times. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. LeBreton. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here this evening. I, I appreciate it. Um, my name is Matt LeBreton. I'm a candidate for school committee. I moved to Hingham 13 years ago with my wife, Michelle. We have three kids. Uh, we have a, a freshman at the high school, a uh, sixth grader at the middle school, and my son, Jake, is at South Elementary School. I didn't grow up in Hingham. In fact, I grew up very differently uh, than the life that we're all able to, or most of us are able to provide to our children here in Hingham. Um, I grew up, I, my mom had me when she was 17. My dad was um, a substance abuser and abusive. Um, and we moved around a lot. I grew up on the razor's edge of poverty. Um, I didn't live in the same place, the same house, for more than a year until I got to college. Um, so being a part of this community and being up here with my colleagues, it's really an honor for me. So I, I thank you and I, I thank all of you for running. Um, Education is really important to me. It's the difference maker in my life. I went to Salem State. I paid my way through to become a high school history teacher to honor the teachers who provided those opportunities for me. Uh, I ended up going off on a little bit different path and, and went to law school at night, put myself through Suffolk University Law School. And now I have my own strategic consulting firm in Boston. But my passion for education didn't end there. Um, in fact, my volunteerism is intertwined with education and working with kids and families. You know, I, I, I've coached everything from t-ball to tackle football. I was just in a play at the company theater with my daughter. Um, and you know, my board service on volunteer boards. I've been a, a member of the Children's Trust Fund, which works with abused and neglected kids. 
Uh, I'm a member of the Presidential Advisory Board at the Children's Museum, where our raison d'etre for having a board is to bring educational opportunities to kids in rural parts of New England who otherwise wouldn't have access to a high quality education. I recently came off the board of the BASE, which is a nonprofit in Roxbury, designed to give educational opportunities and get kids excited about education, change their families, change their lives through education. And finally, I spent um, 10 years on the board of trustees at Salem State College. We have about a $65 million budget for our schools here. I was one of seven or eight board members, I think, at that, at that point to uh, manage an over $100 million budget. So there's a lot more I'd like to talk about. I thank you again for having me here, and I look forward to the questions. Thank you. We will now move on to the questions. Just a reminder, you have one minute to answer each question. And we will start with Ms. Anderson. What is your number one priority for the school committee, and how will you advance it? Thank you. Um, for me, everything goes back to communications because I think that really feeds into everything we're doing from the budget to the override to working with other town departments. We need better communications and that will really help to get buy-in. So as we talk about the budget for next year, I think what we saw a lot of this year was um, people working in their individual silos and the sustainable budget was a great beginning to getting different departments working together in different um, committees working together and talking about what we need as a town and we need more of that we need to be working as a town we have so many needs from foster school to the senior center the new pool the safety building and in order to get all of those things it has to be a community-wide effort and that's going to take a massive marketing push it's going to take everyone buying in and understanding why we have all these needs and how we're going to use revenue across the town to meet them. There's only so much to go around and we need to find ways for everyone to understand how to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. LeBreton. Thank you. Uh, I, I feel like this is a question in law school, I wish it were, where it said there's one question with 17 subparts uh, because I have more than one priority. But uh, the first thing that I think that, you know, I've talked a lot about on the campaign trail. I've, I've been out, um, before I was an officially a candidate, I've, I've started speaking with people in town and I've had over 70 conversations directly with individuals uh, and then spoken in groups with folks. And I think the one key thing that, that we need to do is really develop and encourage a larger and, and more broad discussion of both the things that we agree on and the things that we don't agree on at the school committee. I think we need to bring some transparency, some accessibility to the meetings uh, and to the folks who want to participate. You know, we hear a lot, and it's true, Hingham runs on volunteers. Uh, Hingham parents run on uh, wanting to know what's happening on our volunteer school committee. And part of that is, again, an engagement uh, over things we agree on and things that we don't. There, in the last two years, um, there were a lot of big issues that came in front of the school committee. And I think flushing them out with the community a little bit more and some of the decisions that, that were made might have helped bring the, the pressure down on some of the negativity that, unfortunately, members of the school committee had to deal with. So I think my first priority would be to bring some more transparency and openness. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Correnti. Um, well, I'm an accountant, and so I think with numbers, and it's one of the biggest things that the school committee does, um, but I think it touches everything that we are um, facing as far as the schools go. We fund what we value, and so what, what I did when, we first, when I first joined was to dive into the financial statements of the town and realize there were some things that we could talk about across the um, lines of advisory committee and select board. Um, I was honored to be appointed to the Sustainable Budget Task Force, and I think we have made some great strides there. We have talked um, collaboratively about how we need to move our town forward, and I think that really is um, how we're gonna move the schools forward as well. I think we have been a lean district for a very long time, um, and we have, we've started to um, advance the schools so that we can get the teachers and the students exactly what they need um, to move our, our district forward. So, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cosman. I mentioned a variety of my priorities uh, already. My number one priority would be to put the kids first. I think we need to focus on the students. I think we can do that through having more robust debate and holding district leaders accountable. I'll talk a little bit about special education, uh, which is, I think, an important priority. Um, you know, right now, uh, we, ha we have a daughter who is, uh, is special ed, and it's, it's been a really difficult um, battle, is what I would say. And if it was just my experience and my daughter's experience, that would be hard. Um, but what I've heard in talking to uh, dozens and dozens of parents is they're having basically the same exact experience. So that's not just one, it's 90% of the experiences. And so I think as a school committee, we need to hold uh, the department 
uh, accountable for that. And we need to understand why that's happening and what's driving that. And so I use that as an example um, uh, in terms of how do we make sure we're focused on the kids first. Thank you. Mr. LeBreton, much of the school committee work is done at the subcommittee level. Currently, the subcommittees include curriculum, finance, capital, and facilities, salary and negotiations, special education, and wellness. Please share two subcommittees you would request appointment to and why you would want to serve on them. Thank you for the question. The, the first uh, committee that I would request to be on is finance, capital, and facilities. And in those conversations that I've talked about, I think one thing has become clear. Uh, we have to identify our priorities and start taking a look at what things we want to do in our schools and what things we can't do because we make certain choices. Um, and that, you know, coming from the budget, coming from um, where things, uh, the, the soup gets made, I guess, if you will, is where we can start to boil that up. I've talked a lot on the campaign trail about the fact that the school, excuse me, the board, the select board has 10 priorities. And on those, those 10 priorities, um, I remember earlier this year, they had to, to go through and say, all right, if we want to spend $1,800 to have an election book at Linden Ponds for this upcoming election, we can't do numbers three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten on our list. That really made an impression on me that that's the type of budgeting and thinking that we need to bring to the school committee as well. Um, and then I would love to be on salary negotiations. I think there's a lot going on. I think um, we have a, a whole host of wonderful things that are happening in our, uh, I, mean, I have to stop, but paras need to get paid a little more, I think. <laughs> so. Thank you. Ms. Carrenti. It's actually two committees that I currently serve on. I'm the um, chair of the Finance, Capital, and Facilities Subcommittee, and I'm on the Wellness Subcommittee, which was uh, newly formed this year. I think the finance, I think we are, um, we are headed for um, a possible override, and I think it's critical to have somebody who has the knowledge and experience to take us through that. Um, we've got Foster, we've got the Public Safety Building. So somebody who understands the municipal accounting and how it all works together is going to be critical um, for our town over the next couple years. Um, and then as far as wellness, it is um, really important because of the social emotional aspects of, the, of where the kids are. There's, um, there's not much that we can do there. The, the educators are the, the experts here. Um, however, we can help guide where we want um, the, the superintendent to, to focus. So I think that's a really important one as well. So thank you for the question. Thank you. Mr. Cosman. Uh, so I would also... Uh, like to be on the finance, capital, and facilities, as well as special education. So with special education, I, I, I talked about why I think it's important. Um, I think the subcommittee has an opportunity um, to one, learn more, more about uh, what's going on, and then also to bring that back to the broader committee. Um, I haven't seen a lot of that discussion taking place at the overall school committee, and, and I think that would help uh, with coming up with solutions on how we can improve that. Uh, you know, finance, capital, and facilities is, is obviously an incredibly important uh, subcommittee. It's a huge part of the responsibility of, of the school committee in general, uh, managing the budget. And I, I do think my background um, is, it, you know, a business school background, my job at Fidelity, uh, my love of numbers from, from the beginning gives me the experience that would help there. And to, you know, hopefully uh, be able to bring a, a new perspective and ask some different questions that can help us. Uh, then work more closely with some of the other boards. Thank you. Ms. Anderson. So this campaign, we've heard a lot of talk about differing opinions, so I'm going to say something different. I don't want to be on the finance committee. <laughs> I would love to be, but everyone else has it covered. So I actually would <laughs> request to work on curriculum and wellness. We know that there's a social, a social emotional um, crisis with our students. You know, we've heard about it, we've seen it, we're experiencing it. It's going to be coming out over many years to come. I think we need to really be looking at what we can do for them as well as for our teachers. Everyone's burnt out and we need to bring the focus back to them and their wellness and having some sort of balance. And then in terms of curriculum, I think we need to be really innovative and forward thinking. We need to focus on phenomenon based curriculum, vocational opportunities, more arts programming. And I would like to see executive functioning built in at all levels. One of the things the kids really missed the last few years was executive functioning skills, time management skills, study skills, and this could be built into classes starting in the elementary all the way through middle school and high school for the kids that really miss out on this opportunity. Thank you. Ms. Carrenti. 
The FY 2023 education budget can support some, but not all of the new positions the school administration has requested. Which positions do you think should be added and how do you come to that conclusion? Uh, well, I'd like to see them all. Um, I think the fine arts director is the one that was the one that we heard about the most. Um, I think that's critical from an equity perspective. We have an athletics director, so it would only be equitable for us to also have a fine arts director. Um, the the central office are critical. We hear about how um, we couldn't get certain information and it, it stems directly from not having the right people at the right positions in our central office. I give the example, a superintendent was pulling together the data for vaccination rates for student and um, teachers, pulling it right from the system because we didn't have the people in place to do that. I would rather not pay a CEO level position to do data um, data processing like that. So I think it's critical that we get them as well. Um, and then the counselors, um, the kids are struggling and they need some more social emotional um, support. Um, we've, we've got this crisis going on. So I, I think those are the three critical. Thank you. Mr. Cosman. Uh, so I'll say two things about this. So first, uh, I fully support the fine arts director and uh, adjustment counselors as well. I think those are absolutely needed. Um, what I, what I, I have a hard time answering the question in some ways because what I, what I would like to see um, is better uh, articulation of trade-offs of you know pros and cons around the, the additional positions that we have to close gaps. I think they're all need, you know they're all needed. They're, they're all needed, as well as you know, what are some of the other trade-offs that we potentially could make? Um, not saying that there are positions or things that we're doing that are unnecessary. I don't believe that for a second, but maybe they're not at the highest level of the priorities. And so, I, I really would hope uh, as we go forward, and I think that uh, I think John Ferris has done a great job uh, historically, but I think with a, there's opportunity with a new business director coming in to kind of pull it up a level and have a little bit more of an executive summary to generate some of that better discussion. Thank you. Ms. Anderson. I saw it coming up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, as many know, because I was loudly advocating for the arts director, I firmly believe the arts director is needed, and I'm so excited that it is in motion. Thank you. Um, but I do believe for equity's sake, we need that. But also for the sake of our children, music and other arts programs are shown to benefit um, certain populations in our school who were really missing out and because of scheduling and other issues aren't always able to take some of those arts classes. Having that director will really help to look at that, um, to find data, to be able to measure where, where we're being able to see kids benefit from it. And I look forward to seeing that. I think the second group of um, positions would really be guidance counselors. And not only more guidance counselors, but specialized guidance counselors. Counselors who understand the different programs, the different options, whether it be vocational or students looking to go into art programs when their portfolios are due, can help with um, you know, specialized colleges and other tracks. And then also with the social emotional well-being to be able to have people in place to really proactively look for red flags with students. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. LeBreton. So as a coach and a one-time really bad actor, I can tell you that the equity in having an athletic director and a fine arts director, I think that is important. I'm glad we have them both, and that represents a lot of the kids in our school districts. But I think the question here does go back to what, if we're going to do X, what does that mean we can't do with Y? And, and the larger overall question I think that the school committee is going to have to tackle in conjunction with the town, with ADCOM and the select board, uh, is what that pie looks like. Right now the school committee takes about 65, 67% of the pie for our overall town budget. Um, I think that's probably the right slice of pie, but our pie is going to have to get bigger. And I think we have to look at how we're going to make, how we're going to make our budget bigger, how we're going to do it, how we're going to take a, a, um, a razor, not a cleaver, uh, to certain things so that we can really um, lift all boats in town so we can fund positions we need without having to harm other things within our community and keep that trust and keep the, the uh, reliance on each other in town government together and intact. So I think that's a, it's a great question. Uh, with a lot of different answers, um, but ultimately the positions that, that we need are the ones that will uh, help teach our kids. Thank you. Mr. Cosman, Hingham has made a significant commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging for students and staff. 
What have you done to advance your understanding of or participation in these areas to help further these initiatives? Yeah, so I, um, I am not a DEI expert. There's no question. Um, and I, but through the last, I'd say, 10 years, I've gained, and this is mostly through work, I would say, I've gained a much better understanding of um, what my background as a white male uh, heterosexual, grew up with two, parent, two, two parents in Hingham, affluent. Um, that's afforded me a lot of uh, privilege, of unearned, um, of unearned things that other people just ha don't have it just by nature of what, you know, how, they, how they were born. Um, and so I've learned a lot. I've read a lot. Uh, I've tried to act a lot uh, and model it at work. Um, there's a lot more work that I need to do to, 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 to both learn and um, put myself out there more when I see something that isn't right. Um, and I pledge to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Anderson. Thank you. It's a great question. Um, you know, and it's something I think we all have to really look inward and, and think about. And over the last year, we've seen incidents at the schools that have been really unfortunate. And when this happened, um, I did reach out to some of the student leaders to speak with them, to listen to their feelings, to understand where some of these things came from. I also sit on the high school council. And of course, that these incidents came up for discussion. And I was part of that discussion with the principal on how we would handle them, how we would handle things fairly, how we would try to get a better understanding, how we would bring groups together to discuss what happened and move forward in a positive fashion and learn some lessons from it. I'm also sitting on the strategic planning committee and part of the discussion there has been how do we bring equity into every aspect of the plan? And that's something that I pledge to continue to push on because I think it's so important and every tenant and every goal within that plan needs to have equity, diversity, inclusion and belonging built into it. Thank you. Mr. LeBreton. Thank you for the question. This, this is a question that hits home for me um, in, in a lot of ways, but one is that when I talked a little bit about my upbringing, you know, the, the diversity, the largest percentage of diversity we have in this community is economic. Um, there are a lot of people in this town who um, don't have two homes, don't use the word summer as a verb, um, who have uh, needs and go unseen. And I, I was unseen as a kid, and I was able to, through a good mom and through education and good teachers, um, be able to achieve some things in my life that I'm really proud of. But I was able to do that looking the way I look, not um, having to go through life, um, having been prejudged based on things that I, are outside of my control. Um, so, you know, I talk a lot in the campaign about perspective, and that's a perspective that I, I bring. I, I know a little bit about what it's like to be an outsider, but not fully. Um, and I think that helps uh, me a little bit in forming that opinion. And I've done that. I've gotten involved in these issues. That's why I was on the board in the base because I recognized um, the challenges that certain kids had, that they would never have the opportunity, either economically or sport-wise, but then also because people were not gonna like them because of the color of their skin or how the, the, the way they walked or talked. Um, I have to stop, but it, it hits close to home, so thank you for the question. Thank you. Ms. Correnti. Um, this is a huge passion of mine. Um, because of um, something that happened when I was growing up, I didn't, there were times that I didn't feel like I belonged. I, um, grew up going to the my mom was a single mom and I grew up going to the Boys and Girls Club and realized how important it is that sense of belonging is um, and I, I think we have students here that don't feel like they belong they don't feel like they are seen um, they they don't feel like they are authenticated and I, I think we have a world and a you know even a state that doesn't look like what Hingham looks like and I think it's a shame because I, I want our kids to be exposed to the diversity that exists everywhere because that what's that's what makes a successful student um, you know I, I am the I'm on the um, this the school committee liaison for the diversity equity and inclusion working group we've been working on the equity audit for the past couple years and it is a long process but really really important um, we're working okay we're working with a coach and she's been wonderful so we're implementing some changes there thank you mr. LeBreton Electric buses, cafeteria composting, and solar panels are environmentally sustainability practices that are in various stages of discussion or implementation. What practices would you like the district to implement to contribute to Hingham's 
net zero policy goal? Um, this came up just in, in another forum. Believe it or not, this is, I think, our fifth or sixth forum. Uh, so we've got to know each other's answers pretty well. Um, <laughs> but um, in some conversations around town with uh, members of other appointed and elected boards, has come up um, the need for solar panels in our schools. As said here, that's something I, I absolutely commit to working with the appropriate boards in town to see happen um, in Foster when it's built, hopefully. Um, that, that our town will continue to come together around that, but in our existing parcels and in, in our existing buildings as well. Uh, there was a question yesterday about what do we do with the bus yard uh, and can we do some things differently there? I, I think that's a great question and one that we really need to take our time to look into. You know, at the end of the day, I, I'm, a, I'm a dad, I'm a lawyer, uh, I'm a, hoping to be a volunteer on this board. I don't have all the answers now, but I commit to working with the community uh, to finding the right answers and the right solutions to get to net zero. It's absolutely critical. I live in South Hingham, but if we don't do something, I'll be underwater at some point. So, thank you. Mr. Cosman. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I am also not a climate expert uh, because I, <laughs> cause we got this question yesterday. I'm not a climate expert. And so I wouldn't say that I come in if elected with these are the four things the schools should be doing uh, to, obtain, to obtain this goal. It's the right goal. It's the right goal for this town. It's the right goal for the state. It's the right goal for the world. So I, I absolutely commit that, that I would be supportive of working with uh, other boards, other experts, learning, understanding uh, what we can do as a school committee to support that. Um, and, and that's what I would do uh, uh, over the next three years. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Anderson. Thank you. Um, I actually, I love this question. I currently sit on the town committee, the Cleaner Greener Hingham Committee. It's had a variety of names, some really long, some short, like the Dump Committee. Um, but I do sit on that currently, and you know, it's it's also something that I helped with at South Elementary. I worked with the fifth graders, and we did some projects in regards to recycling, and they loved it so much that I stayed on and worked with the next group of fifth graders um, well past when my children had moved on putting in recycling programs at the school, bringing on speakers, and having just a workshop with those, those fifth graders as leaders of the school. They do a lot already. They do composting in the cafeterias. They have a program at the high school. I know Hingham Net Zero was right on it when we were talking about the special education buses. They already were following up about meeting the Net Zero goals. Foster is working with Hingham Net Zero and will continue to in their plans, and I think that's really important that we work into every aspect of that building to meet with our town's goals. So it's something that I, I really have enjoyed working on with the town and I would be excited about continuing that. Thank you. Deep breath, last question before your closing statements. Oh, sorry. My mistake, you're right. I checked you off a little bit too early, sorry. <laughs> Ms. Corrente. Um, so Hingham uh, has a goal of hitting net zero by 2040. I think there are several things already in motion that we're talking about um, for the schools to discuss moving forward. Uh, it did come up yesterday. Um, I am the finance chair and we have already started talking about the buses. Uh, we lease our buses, which is a great program that we had implemented a few years back, which saved us a bunch of money. Um, but we're working with Hingham Net Zero to um, look at different ideas on and, and get electric buses. We're, we're planning on taking a field trip to see other communities and see how they do it. Um, so that's currently going on right now. Um, we know the foster is, um, we're talking about foster and making sure that that's in the right place to make sure that it does um, exist in 70 years from now. And the other area is solar panels. So we have uh, the roofs on the schools that are being built, are being built to be solar panel ready, um, which I think is important so that we can achieve that goal by 2040. Thank you. Thank you. Now take a deep breath. <laughs> Last question before your closing statements. We will start with um, Ms. Anderson. Last week, the town of Marshfield voted to join the South Shore Technical School District, guaranteeing the town slots in the school. Do Hingham students have sufficient access to vocational programs? If not, what steps do you propose taking? Thank you. Um, no, they don't have sufficient access to vocational programs. We have um, what was known as the Traces Program, and that has some wonderful options, but right now we don't have a full vocational option. And it's not a quick process. So even though Hingham is looking into joining um, South Shore Votech, 
it, it's a long process to start. It requires going through our town meeting process to have it voted on, and then it requires all the towns that are part of it to go through their town meeting process and vote on it. So kids currently entering in high school may have the chance, you know, in three, to three years or so, two to three years, if we get accepted, but likely they will age out of our schools before they have our, that opportunity. So we need to look at short-term options for them and be providing some innovative um, and additional options for these kids who want those vocational programs. Thank you. Ms. Carrenti. Thank you. I, yeah, I don't believe we have um, enough options for the kids. Um, as I said in the opening statement, uh, we have to normalize that that not everybody is going to go to a four-year college, um, and that's okay, and we, we need to have programs to allow other opportunities. Um, as Ellie had mentioned, it is a lengthy process. We do have some things in the school that are happening now. We have a traces program um, that the kids can participate in, but it's not nearly enough. Um, so we need to be able to give these kids these opportunities so that they have other options as they move forward in their in their educational careers. Thank you. Mr. Cosman. Thank you. Uh, so I would also say no. Uh, and this is something where I look again this is another area that I'm not an expert in uh, and I don't <laughs> which is a recurring theme but I you know what I would what I would say is uh, we need to look at, I agree that we need to look at the options and we need to do it quickly we need to come up with what are the three most realistic options that we can we can uh, provide these services whether it's in through our town or whether it's through other towns um, talk about what the pros or cons are and uh, and evaluate you know and some of that's going to be there's takes too long to provide it and it's you know we're not gonna be able to offer it to the current high school kids and then we need to move on that um, so that's what I would commit to doing uh, I think this is definitely something that is important we ta I talked about making sure that that we focus on the kids and that in all kids and there is absolutely a population that this type of programming would uh, would benefit significantly thank you mr. LeBrenton thank you. Um, let's we'll make it four for four uh, we have got to do more uh, with our vocational education and training opportunities for kids look there's a national debate right now on student loan repayment not you know call, going to college is not the answer for every kid uh, there are plenty of, of children out there who can go out uh, go to a vocational school get uh, an education in, in the trades and then not have student loans and make six figures a year and go out and to have a, a very wonderful productive life and I think we need to foster that we need to meet kids where they are um, whether they're in SPED whether they're in uh, their AP ready or whether we're talking about vocational schools and opportunities um, we need to recognize as a school system as a school district and as parents and adults that kids are different they have different strengths and weaknesses and meet them with their strengths and help them with their weaknesses. So I think it's a shame that we're not a part of this collaborative, um, and it's something that I think we should pursue uh, very diligently, very quickly. Uh, it's been said earlier, so we'll take time. There's a lot that we're doing in town. There's a, there are a lot of studies, there are a lot of things that are gonna take three, five, seven years. Um, kids don't have that amount of time, and we need to act as quickly as we can to provide as many opportunities uh, for our children as we can. Thank you. Thank you. We will now move on to your closing statements. Reminder again, it is one minute for your closing statements, and this is in reverse order of your opening statements. So, Mr. LeBreton. First, thank you for having me here. Look, this, is, this has been quite a journey to go through this process. There's just over a week left, um, and then we can all get back to uh, not having to have our eyes cluttered by yard signs around town. Um, but, look, it's, th these are really important issues, and I think, you know, when I closed, in the last question I spoke about meeting kids where they are, that's where we are as a town. I mean, we, we need to meet each other where they where we are we need to meet meet our kids where they are and foster them to the best of our abilities before my minute is up and it goes by a lot quickly a lot quicker than I think um, I want to take this final up 30 seconds I want to take this final opportunity um, to thank Matt and Ali and Ness uh, for uh, being the honorable good people that you all are running a wonderful campaign it's been a pleasure to be on the campaign trail with you the three of you um, and I look forward to working together in some capacity no matter what the outcome is on the 14th together to move our kids and our schools and our town forward. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cosman. Thank you. Thank you uh, again for everyone being here. Uh, so I've said this uh, a second ago. I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in education. I'm not an expert in climate. I'm not an expert in DEI. My wife would say I'm not an expert in parenting or being a husband. <laughs> um, so what am I? Uh, I am someone that is passionate. Uh, I care. I'm organized, I like to look at data, I like to think about how can we solve problems. I follow through and I work with other people to do that. Um, and I think I can bring that to the school committee. 
Um, my volunteering in town to date has really been focused on sports. I love sports. I love kids, and that's when where my kids love sports, and so that's been a great, great match. But in the last two years, I've focused a lot on attending all the school committee meetings, many of the select board meetings, AGCOM meetings, and I found another passion, and I hope I've earned uh, one of your three votes on May 14th. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Anderson. Thank you. Our Hingham schools stand on a really strong foundation, but there's a lot of work to be done, and I pledge, if elected on day one, to work hard to move our schools forward. I've built strong relationships across our town committees through my work on the school councils, Cleaner Greener Hingham, the strategic plan, and much, much more over the years. Having these established relationships means I don't have to spend time building them, and I can get right to work. I have 25 years of business experience helping entrepreneurs improve business and grow their revenues, and I'll approach the school committee much the same way that I do with my clients, finding opportunities for improvement and efficiency. And I'll continue to ask the tough questions. Everyone who knows me knows, um, and apologies to the school committee, I ask a lot of questions. And I'll continue to do so. But just because something's always been done a certain way, it doesn't need to continue to do so. I've been committed to our town and our schools, and I have the record to prove it. I'll fight to ensure our schools meet the needs and the demands of all our students now and in the future. And I ask for your vote on May 14th. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Carrenti. Thank you. Um, I have uh, such a tremendous respect and admiration for the League of Women Voters. Um, it's thoughtful, civic-minded, um, which is why I, I contribute my professional services as the organization's treasurer. Um, one of the reasons why I love Hingham is because we bleed purple. Um, we, we unite on so many topics, um, the things that we prioritize. I will always say that we agree more than we disagree. Um, so it's just a matter of getting together and having the discussions. Um, the education of our children and achieving the mission of our district are the priority that transcends partisans, partisan lines. Um, and, and you know, in fact, tonight you heard you, we need to hear more debate. Um, but as you've witnessed, we, there are a lot of agreements here. Um, so. The, the town is bleeding is bleeding purple. Um, my contributions is that I am a CPA. I have over 20 years of experience. I was on the Finance and Capital Subcommittee, um, on the Sustainable Budget Task Force. Um, I have a passionate commitment to the students. I have n institutional knowledge, um, which will allow me to, um, my time's up, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Nancy. Thank you very much to all of you for joining us this evening. And you guys were great on the timing. Just saying. <laughs> so thank you. We will now move on to the Sewer Commission. Welcome, gentlemen. We will begin with your opening statements. A reminder, you have two minutes for opening statements. And we will begin uh, in the ballot order. So um, Dr. Schultz, you are first. Thank you. Um, most of you are probably surprised. Why is he back up there again? <laughs> yeah. You know, for many, many years, um, the Super Commission race was uh, uncontested because people didn't run for that. I know that since I've been involved in the Sewer Commission, we've had three different members uh, resign, quit, and so we've been shorthanded. So this is unusual, and uh, just getting to know Joe, he's a fabulous guy. I really like him. So the reason that I'm running for the uh, Sewer Commission, my second, this will be my, uh, I'm in the second uh, term now, is because I was asked to solve a problem. And the problem is that when we went to town meeting back in 2011, 2012, we changed the sewer commission from what it was into a, a new hybrid model in which the sewer commissioners would deal with a race setting uh, policy and planning, but the town DPW would actually run the day-to-day -day operations. And that was done to save money. And I'll tell you something, Randy's done a great job with saving money. He's great at that. But uh, one of the problems are that is that we don't have on the sewer commission uh, any executive director. And you know that position, the DPW, is not identified as being our executive director. So the commissioners, the three of us that are on there now, we have to do everything. And so it's been hard. 
And so fortunately what we have coming up this fall is the Water Transition Committee is going to be looking at the governance structure of the uh, Water Board. And maybe that's something they'll put the two of them together, I don't know. But at the very least, I hope that the Sewer Commission gets an Executive Director to help us with the, uh, um, the, 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 the meeting with the other town boards, town uh, attorney being one of them, our uh, expert consultants, because it's been, it's been difficult. Again, the three of us done all the work ourselves. You know, I personally wrote the, uh, the regulation. We just passed regulations last Thursday. I did all 700 words. And that was the original regulation that we, uh, the Sewer Commission had put in, which is generic, back in 2016. So it had examples. It was, it was awful. And so we didn't get everything we want, but uh, we're moving forward with the Sewer Commission. So thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Kelly. Good evening. I'd like to uh, thank everybody for putting this here, together here tonight. Good to see all the candidates again, and um, I just this I think highlights the volunteerism of the town of Hingham and what makes Hingham the incredible place that it is to live in. Uh, it's that community spirit, the vo the the civic engagement of everybody here in this room. The League of Women Voters certainly has a big part in that, and I want to thank Dr. Schultz for his over 20 years of service to the town of Hingham. Um, my name is Joe Kelly, <clears throat> and I'm running for the Sewer Commission. I have five children. Um, from 14 to 18 months old, diapers to middle school, everything in between. And um, my family tries to engage upon that spirit of volunteerism in the town. My wife, Crystal, is here with me tonight. She is the chair of the Conservation Commission. And, um, you know, we're trying to instill that in our children. Our oldest son, Aiden, is, you may see him on Tuesday and Friday afternoons at the, um, <clears throat> the Harbor House pulling bingo balls. Um, because he's getting involved and he finds some some good um, community spirit in that as well and the reason I'm running for the sewer commission is I have over 23 years experience in the construction maintenance and utility industry and you know I, I, I see where volunteerism can be in the sewer commission can be put to good use I currently serve on the public safety building committee um, it's been an incredible couple of years on that committee we've done a lot I've learned a ton and I'm really looking forward to talking to people and <clears throat> and working collaboratively with the current sewer commission to bring the next phase forward for the sewer commission and I'm just about out of time so I'll answer some more later on thanks thank you dr. Schultz Hingham has two sewer districts which combined service approximately 3,000 businesses and residences how should the sh Sewer Commission decide whether or not to allow new sewer connections in these districts? Well, we actually have three districts. Uh, the south uh, hasn't been uh, built out yet and designed. But um, the way the Sewer Commission decides that is do we have adequate flow? Now, one of the reasons that uh, um, you know, I'm on there is because the sewer deals with Title V flows, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm very familiar with Title V. And so uh, we have in the North Sewer District um, situation that we have a lot of inflow and infiltration. So there was a move a couple of years ago to close the North Sewer District to additional hookups because of that excess. You know, think of our water. Uh, we have about 20% uh, leakage. We have almost double that in the North District. Currently in the, um, uh, the Weir River District, that is closed because actually of some faulty, uh, no, some outdated, not faulty, I apologize, some outdated um, documents that we have within the uh, sewer department. We're looking to reopen that, but that was closed back in 2017 based on a false premise that we didn't have capacity. And so there's actually a lot more to talk about this. I see the stop, and hopefully maybe the next question I'll kind of commandeer some of that time to talk a little bit more about it. So it's a great question, and how does the Sewer Commission decide whether or not to allow new sewer connections? We, we as a community need to make the decision that we want to encourage people to make those sewer connections. It's environmentally one of the most important things we can do. The lead cause of pollution on the South Shore through Cape Cod in our, in our waterways and estuaries is in fact increased nitrogen from septic systems. There's a big movement on Cape Cod to reel these back and install septic systems, I mean, sewer systems, and get away from septic because of the pollution that, that comes from it. So there is a huge responsibility 
for the Sewer Commission to try to make these things available and encourage people. There's a lot of fear centered around it that the Sewer Commission uh, and connections may lead to planning and zoning. And, and it's just not the case. The, the Sewer Commission is not the zoning or planning board and we have an environmental responsibility as good stewards in the town of Hingham to encourage sewer connections wherever possible and whenever possible. Thank you. Mr. Kelly. Committee minutes posted on the town's website are one way to inform the public of the activities of the Sewer Commission. How important is direct communication with the public and how do you propose to possibly improve it? So as the only millennial running for the Sewer Commission seat here, yeah. Um, on the top end of the millennials, um, you know, the Sewer Commission sends bills twice a year, right? We can send information to people in the mail, but social media, I think, has changed and revolutionized the way people communicate around the world. Um, I, I, have, I have family uh, in Ireland and other parts of the world, in, Euro in Europe, and uh, my mother was just in the Caribbean. We communicated we, and communicate all the time through apps like WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger. And lots of folks are plugged in. I've, my, my mother is on that. My aunt is in her late 70s. She's on this. I mean, we, we have Facebook pages for everything, Instagram, Snapchat, text messaging. I mean, really, the information is at our fingertips. And we need to, re we need to be much more transparent with the Sewer Commission. I was in this building last week when the Sewer Commission was, was making a huge change that would change, uh, huge, uh, passing a, a regulation that would change the way people uh, pay their sewer bills and costs that will be added and you know I was the only member of the public here. Thank you. And Joe Fry, he was the only member of the public. It's unfortunate you know we promulgated what we uh, posted those regulations back in uh, July uh, on our website along with a uh, corresponding um, um, information package of what we were doing to to do with these regs, a red line version and a draft version, again, July. And so uh, we posted it in the newspaper as we were required to do by law three consecutive times, but there are better ways of getting information out. And so um, I agree with Joe that I'm not a millennial, but I know the website pretty well. Um, we can always do better at uh, information. Now, Joe brought up a great point earlier about uh, sewer is not the way to zone the town. And so that's the piece I was going to bring up. And you, we're seeing that, you always see it uh, within the town. And that's part of what's going on here in the, um, um, the Weir River District, unfortunately. But uh, we can uh, do better by uh, getting the information out. The only thing I, I point out is, you know, sewer regs are not uh, on the cusp of what people want to talk about and uh, not your high priority issue. And so uh, you really need to go to a unique uh, audience for that. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Schultz. The master plan notes that Hingham needs to protect their critical public infrastructure along the coast from sea level rise. Two sewer districts are near the coast and are vulnerable to sea level rise and tidal storm surges. What actions would you take to work with the Climate Action Committee to protect sewer pump stations? I was uh, chairman of the Hingham Master Wastewater uh, Planning Committee, and so we looked at the entire town of where our needs are. So that's already been done, and that was part of the previous question that I said I was going to move back into. Uh, this one here, what have we done in Sewer Commission? You know, I've only been there for two terms. And so we have uh, done two things. We're we doing a capital project replacement along 3A, and you know that stupid 45 degree angle up there at Stoddard's Neck, that's six years that we still haven't got it and we need to get that done because without it, we can't handle the capacity that we um, can generate on the downstream side. So that needs to be done. In addition to that, we just got a grant from the state government to study replacing the entire Route 3A force main. And we we're awarded that from the submission that we put in last, uh, last spring. So we are working for it. We're on the resiliency um, list for the state, and we've been approved um, to be included within that uh, list of available um, uh, monies to study the reconstruction of the forced main on 3A. That's what we've done. Mr. Kelly. So what actions would I take with the climate action? I would immediately address the inflow and infiltration problem we have. We are pumping water to the MWRA that our ratepayers are paying for that is not coming through water mains. 
So there is water getting into the sewer system somehow. It's not clear. People, so maybe somebody's illegally dumping it, or maybe there are other infiltration problems. And that is also an environmental problem. We, if it's coming in, it's going out, it goes both ways. And we need to make sure that that is addressed. And I want to work, I've, I learned a lot working on the Public Safety Building Committee, uh, working hand in hand with Hingham Net Zero. I initially joined Hingham Net Zero, but when they became involved with the Public Safety Building Committee, I thought maybe I shouldn't be on both. It might be a conflict. But I think that we need to work with Hingham Net Zero and, and bring the sewer commission into a net zero position. We have buildings that could have solar. There's flow of, of wastewater that we can, conduct, we can create electricity from and use it for thermal energy if we need to. Thank you. Mr. Kelly. Hingham Sewer Department needs to continue replacing aging pipes and address infiltration and inflow issues. What are your priorities for the maintenance plan for the system? So number one, I've already had this conversation, I've had a bit of this conversation with um, Randy Sylvester. We need to identify primarily the, the most inflow and infiltration on the particular sewer line, or the, or the, sewer, line, the sewer system that has the biggest INI problem, and we have to address that first. There are several ways to do it. We can dig up streets and replace pipes. We can line the pipes with new lining technology that comes up, has come out recently, and we can continue to build upon that system for, you know, to, to bring the cost down. At the end of the day, it's the rate payers that are paying for the repairs on the system. So if we can keep the cost low and build upon and maintain that system, for years to come with new plastic piping technologies and lining that we have now. That would be primary, uh, that would be number one, goal number one on day one. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the regulatory changes I put in there was we didn't have the definition, or even the words infiltration inflow in there. I bet most of you don't even, don't even know what that is. It's a huge problem and it needs to be addressed. So we have a maintenance plan for the uh, pumping station. We've been working through those through capital plans. But the maintenance plan that we have through the, uh, the, the system itself, you know, a couple of years ago, we actually were going house to house up in a neighborhood uh, by the beach uh, with the police department knocking on doors on a Saturday to have our um, employees go in there to check to see if there are illegal sump pumps in that neighborhood because we determined from the flows from that pumping station that when it rained we seem to have a lot more flow from that area than when it doesn't rain which is indicative of illegal inflow and so in it, what I suggested in the plan and the new regulations is why don't we have a system similar to what we have in Title V that uh, whenever the house changes that we have an inspection program you go in there having a plumber uh, just look around to see if there is any inflow uh, you know have that change from going the sewer system to, to, to pumping it out in the, uh, the yard in a dry well and then also potentially looking at the uh, 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 the main drain that's going to the street that's something that our employees asked us to put in there and so we did that thank you now move on to your closing statements cool. reminder one minute and we will start with you, Mr. Kelly. Thanks again for everybody for all the hard work they put in, whether they're just running for, uh, whether they're running for office or they're on a board or a committee here in town. Um, certainly, like we've heard from everybody here tonight, uh, this town absolutely 100% runs on volunteers. I, and my family is completely committed to the volunteerism of this town. Like I said, we serve on several town boards and um, I just want to address that when, I, when I'm elected to your next sewer commissioner, the first, the top four priorities that I will focus on are long-term planning with the MWRA and the residents of the town of Hingham. That's what we need immediately is a long-term solution to this decades-long sewer issue that we've had. Uh, we absolutely must address the inflow and infiltration system all, uh, right away, and transparency and communication is key. I get a text message three or four times a day from the town of Hingham telling me today is okay to burn. There's a public safety meeting tonight. There's this meeting tonight. I, I think it would be very easy to add the sewer commission and, and, and things like that. And, you know, my goal of making the town's utilities net zero. It's, uh, it's a priority that this town has made public at, pub, at town meeting last year, and that's the goal. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate that. Um, 
Joe is correct. We have a planning problem with the sewer commission. And so, again, one of the reasons I was asked to go on there by Selectman and some of the uh, uh, people in town was because of my experience in the Board of Health uh, dealing with that and the organizational skills I have, the writing skills I have, but also I was chairman of the um, Master uh, Wastewater Planning Committee. So I'm quite familiar and knowledgeable within this field. And so I like Joe, we need to have a, a plan and we need to execute that plan. And part of it is right now we have a governance issue that we can't really plan that well because we don't have any staff to be able to do a lot of the things that we'd like to do. But, you know, I see that being solved hopefully soon. And I hope that this fall, you know, what the town decides, and it's not me, uh, whether we're going to have a combined group or keep it separate, I think that moving forward, once we have a definitive uh, uh, governance structure and, and help, you know, I'd we need an executive director. I'd love to get the water guy, but, you know, that's not my, uh, uh, my space. Remember, I keep my space. <laughs> but uh, um, once we do that, then we'll be well on the road to uh, solving a long-term problem that we've had since the 1940s in Hingham Sewer District. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us this evening. I would like to close the forum this evening by thanking all of the candidates uh, for their participation in our democratic process and the Hingham League of Women Voters for sponsoring this event. Please remember to vote on Saturday, May 14th. The polls are open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Please encourage your friends, your neighbors to vote. If you know someone who can't get to the polls, please offer them a ride. If you will be out of town for the election, contact the town clerk's office about an absentee va ballot. And please note something a little bit different this year. Under Massachusetts general law, the town of Hingham had to change some voting precincts and add a seventh precinct to reflect population changes as calculated by the 2020 federal census. Voters whose polling locations changed and those assigned to new precinct seven or seven A received written notification of this change via snail mail. If you are not sure of if your precinct changed, you should go to the town clerk's website and that will provide you information as to where your precinct is. Um, the new precinct 7A um, will now be, um, all, they have their own at Linden Ponds, but please remind people to check so you don't have to make two trips to the polls. Um, so please do that. And I also can't encourage you enough to talk to friends and family members who say, my vote doesn't count. Your vote matters. In January of 2022, I had to moderate another forum for the city of Framingham. Their town council election for one of the spots ended in a tie. It did go to court, but it was two votes got thrown out. There was a tie. So when somebody says my vote does not matter, it does. So thank you again. And please remember, democracy is not a spectator sport. Thank you. <laughs>